Thanks. Well, did you all catch Joji Muramoto's talk this morning? He was talking about strawberry production in California. And of course, if you saw the yield figures from California, if you're familiar with strawberries, you were floored. I think it was, what did he say, 68,000 pounds per acre. That's incredible. You know, there's, we don't have any place else in the US that really competes with that. And that's part of the reason straw, that California produces well over 80% of the strawberries produced in the US. But still, there are a lot of consumers that say they would like to get locally produced strawberries. And many of those consumers would prefer to get organically produced ones. So with this team of folks, uh, Debbie Inglis and myself from Washington State University, Annette Wislecki and Jeff Martin from University of Tennessee, and Russ Wallace from Texas AgriLife, um, we decided to see what we could do to develop organic production systems for strawberry for three very diverse environments that are almost certainly all pretty unrepresented or underrepresented in the strawberry world right now. Let's see if I can figure this out. So here's the three climates that we chose to, to produce in. One is, uh, is home to me. This is Mount Vernon, Washington. It's a Köppen Geiger CFB, which means it has cool, humid summers. Actually, it's cool and humid about 364 days out of the year. Um, it's, it's a wonderful place to grow uh, potatoes. It's a wonderful place to grow spinach uh, seed. It's a, actually a wonderful place to grow strawberries. But it's a very difficult place to grow organic strawberries because we have a lot of botrytis pressure and we have a lot of weed pressure. The next site is about as far away from that climate as you could get. This is Lubbock, Texas in the High Plains. It's a BSK, which is a steppe climate, has hot, dry summers, and they ain't kidding. It is very, it's uh, quite hot, quite dry. The wind blows a lot in Lubbock. It's very cold in the winter as well. The third location is also warm in the summer. This is Knoxville, Tennessee. It's a Köppen Geiger CFA. It has hot but humid summers and not as much wind as Lubbock does. So in Knoxville and Lubbock, we grew strawberries outside and in four season tunnels. And these are tunnels with um, Closed ends, sides that can be vented, um, a fair amount of bracing. In the case of Lubbock, there's a lot of bracing in the tunnels because of the wind pressures that we anticipated. Um, and the, as you can see, they're grown, they're, they're grown on plastic um, on, uh, in the ground. This is not a, a substrate project. In contrast, in Mount Vernon, we were producing outside and in three season tunnels. These are tunnels without nearly as much wind bracing. They're much less expensive to erect. Um, they don't have end walls. And they're intended to be up for just three seasons of the year. In Mount Vernon, we get a lot of wind storms from November through April. So during that time, we take the plastic off of the tunnels. These are the varieties and the plant types that we've used. Um, if you're already familiar with strawberries, you'll recognize that this, these upper ones are day neutrals, uh, strawberry varieties that will continue producing fruit as long as they're growing. And these lower ones are June bearing strawberries. It's the kind that, that only initiate floral buds during short days. We started out in 2010 uh, doing just the day neutrals. And then in 2011, because it looked like the June bearers were better in the, um, in the southern locations, we added the, uh, them to the mix. We also um, have done these plants as, uh, in different ways, either as bare root plants or from plugs. And more about that a little bit later. So our crop management practices differed in all of these locations, as you would imagine they would, because they're different environments altogether. Um, but in general, we followed a similar strategy to the one you heard from Joji. Uh, there was about 60 to 80 units of N per acre of pre-plant fertilizer put down prior to planting. And then the plantings was, were supplemented, generally weekly, with, um, 
with uh, a, a nitrogen fertigation once growth got started. And so, for example, in Mount Vernon, we added about three and a half pounds of nitrogen per acre per week, um, May to September. Um, the actual amounts differed from one location to another. Lubbock, Texas wound up, whoa, whoop. Lubbock wound up going with conventional, um, conventional products, largely based on their 2010 experience. They, they lost everything in 2010 and they decided they were not going to lose everything in 2011. So they went with conventional um, practices. But in Knoxville and in Mount Vernon, we did stay with uh, organic practices. In, we did have two applications of pyganic for aphids and thrips in Mount Vernon. Um, that's not very many applications for a full season. We had a lot of natural control of aphids. We had an outbreak of aphids, but um, by the time we went to decide whether we should apply anything, uh, most of them were parasitized anyway. We do have a lot of slugs in Mount Vernon, so that was a, uh, um, a pleasure for our work crews to, to put out sluggo to keep them down to a dull roar. Um, in Knoxville, they had um, spider mites, which are very often a problem in tunnels everywhere. They were used MPed, and they used neem oil and lacewing larvae for their aphids. So looking at our marketable yields, um, you can see in this 2010 column, we did pretty well in Mount Vernon. Um, but the other locations had a lot of trouble. And um, part of that was because the day neutrals we were growing did not perform very well in these environments. These are both places with hot summers. So when the day neutrals are cycling into their second production, it's too hot for them to do much. So you don't get that much out of them. Um, they had, we had to wait till 2011 when they included the June bears uh, and they got their production up substantially then. Um, and as you can probably guess here, the June bears didn't do anything for the averages in Mount Vernon. Uh, we didn't get very much yield from them at all. So here's 2011 yields from Knoxville. That's the, um, the hot, humid place. And what you can see is here are the day neutrals up here. Here are the June bears down here. HT is high tunnel, OF is open field. This beautiful looking strawberry here got hailed on. And you can see all the little, looks like freckles on the tunnel here, it got hailed on too. But the fruit that was under this tunnel didn't get hailed on and it was great. It's part of the reason that the yields are so much higher in, in the tunnel compared to what they are in the open field in Knoxville. A lot of that was weather related. The other thing that happened in the high tunnels in this location was that because they're four season tunnels, they encouraged the plants to grow and establish a lot more vigor during the fall and winter months. Uh, they also encouraged the plants to initiate a lot of flowers which they didn't do when they were out in the open because it was too cold in the open. This is Lubbock, Texas. Um, and as you can see, they had their share of wind challenges, but it, they didn't lose their sense of humor about it at least. Um, but what you can see there is that look how close the, the spacing is. Look how much bracing they have in this tunnel. It, the wind absolutely ripped the covering off of this tunnel, but the structure is un, unharmed, undamaged. So they just reskinned the tunnel and they went on until the next windstorm. Um, but wind is, was the major factor that they could not produce strawberries outside the tunnel. Look how low the yields are outside the tunnel. It wasn't just the big windstorms, it was the day to day sandblasting that just literally shredded the plants. Um, people, you know, would tease our Texas cooperator and say, you're nuts, you can't grow strawberries in Lubbock. And, uh, and they were right, as long as you stay outside. But you get into a tunnel, and you can get pretty decent yields. This festival yield, that's about 10 tons to the acre. That's better than an outdoor um, processing field does in, um, in Washington. And that's, well, that's about a third of California pretty darn good and there's nobody else in Lubbock that's going to compete with you on that. 
Um, this is in Mount Vernon. This was our three season tunnel. Uh, this one, unfortunately, was a two and a half season tunnel. <laughs> we had an unexpected windstorm, and this is a, a consistently a challenge with tunnels, is engineering them to deal with the weather events you have in your area. Uh, what we found was we had an unexpected storm that came from an unexpected direction, the west. We usually get them from the south. We had designed our tunnels to take storms from the south. This one came from the west. We lost several skins. We lost one tunnel altogether. What I want to show you here is that in Mount Vernon, we didn't really have a difference in total marketable yields outside versus in the tunnel. Um, these day neutrals do pretty well either outside or in the tunnel. And that's because in Mount Vernon, our summers are cool. And so high um, day neutral strawberries just don't shut down in the summer the way, the way they do many other places. Um, we also looked at disease ratings. I won't get into a too much detail on this other than to give you the bottom line that uh, for managing gray mold caused by botrytis, one of our major impediments to organic production in Western Washington, um, the tunnels reduced it immensely, reduced it to about a fifth of what it was without the tunnels. Um, there's also differences in cultivars. However, we did worsen verticillium wilt problems, probably because we're warming the soil in the tunnels. This is part of a larger project. This is sort of the credit slide for the whole project, which is looking at both the tunnels and the degradation of biodegradable mulches. I don't have time to talk about that part of it, but that's, this is wrapped into that same study. It's uh, funded by the SCRI. And if there are time for questions, if there's time for questions, I'll be happy to take them. Any questions at the very back? Oh, yeah, the yield per plant uh, was, for the better treatments in Mount Vernon, it was about uh, 550 grams per plant. Yes. How long can the plastic be expected to last, notwithstanding the wind? Notwithstanding the wind, um, the manufacturers say three to four years. And um, I think that's probably a reasonable um, expectation for Mount Vernon. We're a little short on uh, solar irradiance, so we like to get every bit that we can. And uh, after three years, the, the, um, the tunnels do get a bit more translucent. And um, we keep a lot of, environment, uh, of weather data on these, and we do see that we have less irradiance in the tunnels once the plastics get older. So I, I think three to four years is probably a reasonable limit for us, but if you were in Lubbock, where you have plenty of insulation, if the wind didn't uh, destroy the plastic, you could probably safely keep it longer. Yeah. Could you speak to the difference between the bare root and the chug plant for Alia? Yes. Yeah. Um, I didn't talk about it all at all because uh, I ran out of time. But thank you. <laughs> um, we had much better results with plug plants than with bare root plants um, when we we compared both plant types for Albion and. What happened was that from the beginning, the plugs established more rapidly. So during the time in which they began to flower, they began with a plant that had, um, had a lot more photosynthetic capacity. And uh, the plant also had um, a larger root system. So the cost difference is about 15 cents per plant. And um, the, the return was about a quarter of the yield that it, it's it winds up being like a couple of dollars per plant, so it's a, it's a good investment to make. Thanks very much.